All right, before we get started, um, I want to give a shout out to a few folks. Um, first, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Damien Sweeney. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the Kentucky Department of Education. I'm also an adjunct professor at Spalding University in the School Counseling Program. Um, previously worked with JCPS as a school counselor, high school English teacher, and special education teacher. I'm on the board with Bounce, um, and Bounce is amazing. We have an amazing, incredible board, um, and so many uh, folks from the Bounce Coalition are on. Um, so wave your hand if you're on the board. Say hello. Um, thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to do is give a shout out to the sponsors of this webinar. Um, we have Aetna Better Health of Kentucky. We also have the YMCA of Greater Louisville. Um, so they've been great partners of the Bounce Coalition and um, we're really appreciative of your sponsorship today. Um, I want you all to know that we're gonna have a survey at the end of our session today, at the end of our webinar today. Um, we always wanna get feedback. We wanna know uh, what went well for you, what we can do better in the future. So um, that feedback, uh, that survey will be coming towards the end of today. Um, please uh, remain on mute and add questions in the chat. We'll make sure that we get to those questions. You're going to hear from um, some incredible speakers, um, one of which I am about to introduce. And then you're also going to, and, and he, I would consider him an expert in that field. Um, and then you're also going to hear from Tia Humphrey, who's on the call. She's got um, lived experience and she's going to um, be able to share quite a bit with you as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter. Um, his name is Dr. Tony Zippel, and he consults in areas related to the development, implementation, and operation of innovative community mental health services. Um, Dr. Zippel has extensive experience managing clinical services, including evidence-based interventions for people with serious mental illness, opioid addictions, tra treatment, intensive child and family services, and integrated supports for people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. Dr. Zippel is currently an executive in residence at the University of Louisville, go Cards, um, their School of Public Health and Information Sciences. He's a senior project leader for the Rutgers University Mental Health School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Um, he's also a clinical psychologist licensed in Massachusetts and has published more than 65 articles, monographs, which we had to learn what monographs were just a little bit ago, um, and book chapters. Dr. Zippel has trained and consulted with organizations across the United States, Pakistan, and Singapore. So um, Dr. Zippel, the floor is yours. Great to be with everyone. Let me, let me do a screen share. Uh, Give me one second to get this set up. All right. Everybody seeing that now? Okay, a few yeah. heads nodding. I appreciate that. <clears throat> We're going to be talking for just a short time. You know, I, I, I've got 20 minutes to talk about trauma and neuroplasticity and resilience and the relationship between those. And that's particularly important, I think, for all of us at Bounce as we think about what does trauma do to the brain and how do we counter that with resilience? So let me start with giving you a little picture of the brain. You know, we've got three pounds of stuff in our skulls that is amazingly complex. You know, there are more than a trillion cells you know, there are billions of neurological connections that go between those cells. Every neuron fires rapidly every second. I mean, every second that you're alive, you have billions and billions of neurons firing and connecting in your skull, right? So there's a lot of action going on there 24 hours a day. Neurons that fire together, wire together. The more that those neurons in our brains fire and connect with each other, the stronger those connections become. Uh, growing up is sort of a process of, of tuning and, and, and pruning our brains, right? You know, when we're babies, we have more neural connections than we do when we're grownups. Because as soon as we're born, we start to amplify the connections that 
are significant to us and the ones that don't matter sort of drift away and in a sense dry up. The other thing that's important about that is that the more we have neurological connections that fire, the more time we run along a neural pathway, not just as the deeper and stronger it becomes, but the faster that process gets the less time it takes for neurons to move along there. So as we do things over and over again, that's what we mean by them becoming easier and habitual. We do them without even thinking because the neural connection is so strong and so fast. So that's a starting point for this about how neural connections work. We use this, I know most of you know, in Bounce 102, we ask people which dog encounter they're going to remember longer. You know, the snarling dog that looks like it's gonna bite your head off or the happy, friendly, peaceful dog in the park. And everybody of course says, I'm gonna remember that snarling dog longer than the peaceful, happy, peaceful, happy dog. And the reason for that is that our brains have a negativity bias, right? Bad things are stickier in our brains than good things. When something bad happens, neurologically, it's stronger. It builds deeper connections. We scan for bad news. We focus tightly on bad news. When we have bad things that happen, you know, we hit that fight or flight mode. We just zero in on that threat right? You know, so, so bad experiences sensitize us to more bad experiences, which sensitize us to more bad experiences. Our brain watches out for those negative experiences. As, as Rick Hansen says, our brain is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. It makes lasting contentment and fulfillment tougher for us. Now, that's a good thing from an evolutionary process. You know, if, if, if you make a mistake and you worry about a tiger being behind a bush when there's no tiger there, you know, the only thing that costs you is a little bit of anxiety. But if you don't pay attention and you say, oh, I'm not going to worry about a tiger being any place and there is one there, then you end up as dinner and you don't get to worry about anything else ever again. So our brains are wired to pay more attention, to get pulled into those negative experiences faster and more deeply. The punchline to this is, and, and we could talk about this a long time and we only got 20 minutes, but the punchline to it is, our biology makes getting stressed easy. It makes resilience harder for us. We get pulled and influenced by negative events more strongly and faster than good events. So bouncing back from things is tougher than getting banged around by traumatic events. And so what does that say to us as we, as we think about working with, with people who have significant levels of adverse childhood experience? Another slide from Bounce 102, it says that we have those chronic toxic stresses as young people, our brains change in ways that aren't good. We have hormonal changes that make us more susceptible to diabetes, cardiac events, that kind of thing. We have neurological changes <clears throat> which make us more reactive and less planful. And we even have genetic changes that are the result of that so that we can, we can carry these changes on in our own lives and pass them on to the next generation. So stress and trauma changes our brains in adverse ways, right? And, and in ways that are kind of irresistible, it's just how we're put together. The question is, how do we counter those? And that's where the question of resilience comes in. How can we bounce back? from stress and trauma. So we know that repeated patterns of brain activity change neural function. We know that that happens in a negative way. Can we harness that same superpower to build resilience? Can we use repeated experiences of positive things to change our brains in a way that increase resilience, happiness, joy, our ability to manage life? And the short answer to that is yes. And we have so many tools for building resilience. You know, we I, I sometimes work out of this kind of a framework of SPIRE, where 
where it's just a way of thinking about the wide range of things that we have at our disposal that help us build resilience and counter that negativity bias. You know, spiritual elements, uh, leading a meaningful life, savoring the present, a sense of purpose in life, that's really important. And that carries us. That's a habit we can build. Physical changes, physical habits like mind-body activities, getting enough sleep and exercise, those kinds of things. Uh, engaging in deep learning and new experiences because we are all intellectual beings. We all do well when we have goals and projects. So our intellectual well-being is a way of building that resilience. Relational uh, uh, issues are also really important. Probably the single best predictor of resilience and happiness are strong social connections. So how can we nurture connections with other people? And of course, emotional experiences, having positive sense of well-being, subjective well-being. We can build in all of these areas ways to increase resilience, increase happiness and counter some of that natural tendency that we have towards negativity and counter some of the damage that's created by stress and trauma. So we have lots of tools at our disposal for working with this. The challenge with this is that changing our brain takes time and energy. I, I was saying earlier that 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 every week now it seems I have something in my email that says sign up for this course on rewiring your brain, you know, and 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 if you if you listen to just those things, you sort of get a sense that 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 rewiring your brain is something that's easy to do, right? You know, you just call the brain electrician and they tweak a few connections in it, and your brain is all better again, right? It's true that we have really much more changeable brains than we used to think. Neuroplasticity is something that's real for us, and it really occurs in positive and negative directions. But I don't want to understate the challenge that it is. You know, we can do it. If you want more happiness in your life, have more experiences of happiness. The more experiences of happiness that you have, the more your brain has happiness as its mode of being. If you want more compassion in your life, have more experiences of compassion. So if you want to have more self-compassion, compassion to other people, do it more often. The more of it that we do, the more of it that we have. Same for personal meaning. If you want to have more personal meaning and purpose in your life, have more of those experiences. If you want to have more social connection, have more of those social connections experiences. Neurons that fire together, wire together. But it takes time, right? You can't, anybody here ever uh, uh, try to learn to play guitar, for example, learn to play a musical instrument? You know, it, it, it takes time and practice. You can't just read about it and say, oh, great. Now I know everything I need to know about playing guitar. I've read all the stuff about chords and about how to stretch the strings and bend notes. I, I know all of that now. I can play guitar. It doesn't work that way. You have to have lots of experience of playing the guitar to really make it real. Neurons that fire together wire together, repetition, time and time again. You've got to build those neural channels and connections so that they're deep and strong and that the neural connections happen really fast. And that just takes practice. There's no way around it. And that's why when we teach Bounce 102, we talk about practices. We talk about things you can do. We talk about building habits of resilience. And by habit, we really mean, you know, doing something over and over again, intentionally and practicing it until it becomes second nature. And we don't have to think about it anymore. How can we make these habits of social connection and compassion, these habits of happiness and, and personal meaning so deep and so natural that it's like brushing your teeth? You know, I don't know about you, but I, when I wake up in the morning, I, I don't have to struggle with the decision about whether I brush my teeth. You know, it just kind of happens, right? Because it's a really deeply ingrained habit. 
how can we make these habits of resilience as natural and deep and strong as things like brushing our teeth? It takes repetition and practice and repetition and practice. One of the other challenges with this is that re-traumatization is a huge setback. You know, when we talk about building strong neural connections that take the place of those bad habits, those negativity biases that we have, all of those older neural connections associated with trauma that pull, pull us down those pathways of, of depression and reactivity and feeling bad, those channels are still there. You know, think of it as like a river. And, and even if you don't have much rain for a long period of time and those creeks and riverbeds dry up and you think they're gone, boy, all you need is a big thunder shower and burst and those things really fill up again. And trauma's like that too. Those neural pathways towards negativity and, and, and trauma, they're still there. They don't go away. They just get more shallow, they get weaker, they get easier to deal with. But when we have re-traumatization, they can fill up again really fast. It's why in Bounce 101, when we talk about, about plans for, for doing this, we talk about avoiding re-traumatization because we can do 10 really good things to help people overcome trauma and then we re-traumatize them in one way and it can undo so much of the good work we're trying to do on teaching people strategies for being happier and more resilient. So avoiding re-traumatization is tough. Moving forward takes work. Setbacks can come easily. Persistence is important. Practice and habits are important with it. Sometimes we, we, we get nudged around this. Some people think that what I talk about with this, that I'm talking about ignoring bad things. And I'm really not. You know, bad things really are bad. Trauma and awful things that happen in our life is real. And you can't ignore those. You know, Tal Ben-Shahar often says it's not a, that everything that happens happens for the best, as you sometimes hear in, you know, kind of toxic positivity and happy talk. It's that we can make the best out of everything that happens. Bad things happen and we can still turn to the good. Bad things happen in our lives and we can still take in the good that's there. We can still make the best out of everything that happens without ignoring the fact that there are bad things that are actually happening. Neurons that fire together, wire together. If we can just take a little extra time to lean into those opportunities for building resilience, it helps us to change those quick moments that we all have of positive experience, you know, into things that are more like lasting neural traits. And that's what we're trying to do in our work and bounce with our clients. We're trying to help them lean in to the good things, lean into the opportunities. And as we talk in, in the small groups today in the breakout sessions, something I think to consider and to really wrestle with is what would work for your clients or for your students in helping them to lean into these positive opportunities, helping them to find ways to help positive neural pathways fire together and wire together. It takes patience, it takes time, it takes a plan, it takes repetition, it takes managing setbacks, but it's something that's really possible to do. So what I want you to take away from this 20 minutes, and that's about all the time I have, are really just a couple of things. One is that our brain do change and that negative experience, stress and trauma changes our brains in significant ways for the worse but that we can change our brains for the better if we lean into opportunities and we create opportunities to have those experiences repeated over and over again so we can help our clients build better habits for resilience, habits for happiness, habits for having a higher level of subjective well-being. That changes our brain for the positive. But I think that's the time I've got, so let me stop with that. Turn it back to Dr. Sweeney. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Zippel. Um, first off, can we, uh, if you have a way of giving a reaction 
in the Zoom room. Um, can you offer him some affirmations for that quick presentation? You should see reactions at the bottom of your um, of your taskbar in Zoom. Um, you can also give affirmations in the chat box. One thing um, that I realized as Dr. Zippel was speaking is um, I've been reading this book called Atomic Habits. I know I'm late to the game with that one. Um, but, you know, um, the small habits that uh, we create can truly change our lives. That's something that really stood out to me um, as he spoke. Um, so really appreciate uh, your words, your time, um, your intentions, um, and, and honestly, the beautiful size that you created. Um, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions that I think other people might be wanting to ask. Is that OK, Dr. Zippel? Sure. And by the way, Tony works even better than Dr. Zippel. All right. Um, all right. Yes, Keith, uh, they stuck with me as well. I told him beforehand, I was like, where did you get the, all these visuals? These are the prettiest slides I've ever seen. Um, so they, they were helpful to me. Um, so, Tony, um, I think that we have youth serving people on the call. We also have adult serving people. Um, what do you notice uh, is the difference when we talk about building, helping uh, the people we serve build resilience? So how would you kind of differentiate our approach to supporting adults as um, we help them become resilient versus children? Is there a difference? Yeah, I think that I think there's some big differences. It's a great question. And we, we know that, that that kids' brains are more plastic than adults' brains. We we used to think that, you know, once once you got past the age of 12 or 15, our brains didn't change at all. But we know that's not the case. Our brains change throughout life. And when we're kids, our brains change faster. The younger we are, the more change there is that's happening in that 1.1 trillion cells inside our skull. And so with kids, they're greatly impacted by stress and trauma because it's got deeper and more immediate effects. It takes less impact to make changes. And so stress and trauma has deeper effects as we're younger. And the good news is, that there, it's also faster to learn positive experience and positive ways to reverse it. So things can happen faster in both the directions for kids than for adults. You know, when you're, when you're 25, 35, 45, 55, and you have deeply ingrained neurological habits around stress and trauma and depression, you can still reverse those, but it takes probably more practice and more intentionality. The good news for adults is that we probably have better capability of, you know, cognitive capacity, ability to understand this. We may have a little more self-discipline in some ways. So we've got some other tools that we can apply that help us to do this longer and harder, but it takes more time and practice, kind of like learning guitar when you're 40 as opposed to when you're six. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing that I've noticed in my life when I'm trying to change a habit is um, having an accountability partner is really helpful. Um, is there research around that? Is that something that you would suggest? How, how do you approach um, folks trying to hold themselves accountable for making those tiny changes with their habits to improve their lives? Yeah, you know, there, there's a there's a whole workshop we could do on 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 change management around habits and habit formation, and one big part of it would be social support. Um, we can do things that support ourselves. You know, journaling, for example, is is a really straightforward way to help support and encourage ourselves and offer ourselves self compassion about our efforts to try to do things. So we can do things internally accountability partners are really cool. You know, if, if you want, if you want to change a, 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 a specific habit or build a specific habit, find an accountability partner. And, and, and all you have to do with this person is get them to agree to talk with you for 60 seconds every day for a period of time. You know, you call them and say, you know, my, my, my goal, uh, uh, if you'll remember, is that I want to be more self-compassionate. I want to offer myself a little more support when things go wrong. And today, I did that really well in some day ways. Or today, I didn't do a very good job of it. But to say out loud how you're doing it to another person, the other person's responsibility is simply to say, 
Thank you. I appreciate your sharing. Keep up the good work. Good luck tomorrow. Whole thing can take 60 seconds, but the obligation that we have to say it out loud to another person holds us accountable. And we are also really, really good at observing ourselves. And if we observe ourselves doing certain things and trying to do certain things, you know, we work much harder at doing it. Uh, uh, so accountability partners can be really powerful. Awesome. Um, 60 seconds can change your life. That's wild. Um, all right. Last question. This is uh, from Terry. Um, I'll use a politically correct term and then I'll use her term. Um, it, what are your thoughts on um, essentially using incentives or bribing people to complete or participate in health enhancing activities uh, for the time it takes for a habit to start to form? Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of research that's been done on this with both kids and adults. And, and I think that the evidence is really clear that bribes increase behavior, right? If, if you want somebody to do something more often and you pay them, they're going to do things more often. For example, with 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 adults with with addictions, even there's a study was done, I think it was in Baltimore with homeless people uh, who had addictions problems. And and what they said was, we're going to give you uh, a phone. And whenever your phone goes off, you have to come in within a matter of a few hours to this spot. We're going to do a urine drop. And if you're clean, we're going to give you 20 bucks. And, and boy, it was amazing how that helped people to manage their addiction. We, we know this stuff works. We know that, 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 that tangible payment makes a difference. The challenge with it is, is how do you transition people from tangible payment into it being more of an integrated part of their life and the rewards being sort of more natural and intrinsic? That takes a plan. If all you're relying on is, you know, I'm going to give you 20 bucks for every A and 10 bucks for every B, that helps. But you've got to find a way also to help people connect with it internally and own it. And if you can do both of those things over the long term, it really makes a difference. But the jump start with a tangible support like that can be really helpful. All right. You just I think you just made my my son some money uh, for doing their homework. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you so much for your information. Um, your presentation was amazing. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, next on the agenda, we would like I'd like to introduce Tia Humphrey. Um, we believe in the power of story and um, lived experience, and Tia's got both of those. She's going to share her own story um, uh, about her experience with trauma. Um, so Tia, take it away. And after you're done sharing, I've got a few questions for you as well. All right, thanks, Dr. Sweeney. Um, pardon, oh, the shakiness. I got it's a little cold in my house. I know someone mentioned the cool mornings are their favorite um, fall activity or whatever, and it's mine too. But still, still gets me sometimes. Also, let me drink my coffee. I'm a little chilly, so it's fine. I won't do anything about it. Anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so, hi, my name is Tia Humphrey. Um, I know some of you, but a lot of you are very new to me. So um, it's a pleasure to meet all of you, all 99 of you, which is crazy. Um, I am a lived expert, former foster youth. I've been out of the system for two years now. Um, however, I still spend my time advocating for foster youth by uh, sharing my testimony and helping other youth develop ways to share their testimonies and empower them to go out and also help um, to advocate for this system. With that being said, um, it is my pleasure to share my testimony with you today. Um, like I said, some of you may know me, so um, the way I share my testimony is very based off of the people that I have in the room with me. Um, and so if you have or have not heard my testimony, great. Um, you may hear something different, something new. Um, so I just uh, hope that you take that as you will and hopefully take something from my testimony to uh, with you after this meeting and um, hopefully encourage that in your practice of some sort. Um, so like I said, I'm a former foster youth. I was put into the system at the age of five with my sister, um, who was six at the time. We were put into the system initially because of um, education, truancy type things. Um, however, um, when I dug deeper, um, I discovered that it was because of homeless, homelessness, uh, domestic violence, and other things. 
So uh, with that being said, I was put into my first home at the age of five, um, along with my sister. We were adopted at, um, I was seven, she was eight um, in that same home. So some people, uh, myself included, found myself uh, lucky. Not a lot of youth uh, get to say that they were put into the system and then adopted in that same home. Um, however, that being said, that is not where my testimony ends. Um, I stayed in that home until the age of 13. That was my longest placement. Um, at the age of 13, I was kicked out of that home um, and put into a different place. Um, it wasn't an official placement, but I was put into a different home um, with an entirely different family who um, was more so an acquaintance to my original adoptive family. Um, I thought it also ended there. However, it did not. Um, she started out being uh, an amazing ally, someone that I could come to, someone that I found very supportive. Um, however, similar in the first home, I experienced a lot of abuse, mental, physical, um, and emotional that ended up um, having me um, removed from that home as well. Um, I went to school and uh, my friends saw some things um, and told me that I should talk to a counselor, which was great on my friend's part um, to help advocate for me in that way. Um, with that being said, I was put into the safe place. Um, you know, you guys, that, that yellow sign you see everywhere. I didn't think it was real at the time. I thought everyone just like really liked that sign. So I, I didn't <laughs> I didn't know that was an actual place. Um, so when I was um, put there, um, it was only supposed to be for like a couple days, a week at the longest. That's usually how long people at the safe place uh, stay. It's very temporary. Um, however, that was not the case for me. Um, if um, someone would stay for a week, that's great. However, I stayed uh, for months Um and I was unaware at that time that I was homeless. Um, they tried to contact the individual that uh, was taking care of me, my guardian at the time. However, as soon as uh, she kicked me out of her home, she completely just disappeared. No one could get in contact with her. Um, I couldn't get any clothes from her or anything like that. So eventually, um, that was something that I was completely unaware of. No one talked to me during this situation. I was just told that I'm just at the safe place. So I stayed there for months um, while everyone else was going in like it was a revolving door. They, people were coming in, people were leaving, coming in, leaving a whole bunch of different people. And with that being said, I had um, eventually a social worker had come talk to me and told me, listen, this is the situation. Um, we are unable to put you back into your original home. You're no longer wanted there. So um, we're going to put you back into the foster system. And so this is where I learned that I had, official, had officially um, experienced a failed adoption, which at that time I didn't know was a thing. I thought when you were adopted, you were adopted. That's it. Like, that's that's what you get. Um so with that being said, a foster family came to the safe place to kind of interview me, um, you know, just sit me down and figure out who I was. Um, and so after that, um, they no longer had to keep extending my stay at the safe place because that foster family agreed to take me in. So I ended up going into foster care at NECO, if you see behind me, um, with my third placement, third and final placement. Um, and I will say this was the best placement I've been in. There were still issues. However, um, this foster parent really tried hard to work with me and um, better me as an individual, as a, as a woman and as a black woman. So for that, I'm so incredibly grateful for her. So with that being said, I was 16 at that time, uh, put into my third and final placement um, where I um, learned everything that there, there was to be an, uh, a teenager. I had my permit. Uh, I got my first job. Uh, and I tell you, once I got my first job and that first paycheck, there was no stopping me. Once I got that, that paycheck, I got like two other jobs after that. And your girl was working at all times, plus going to school. And um, I was very into extracurricular. So I was in marching band. Um, 
I was always going. There was never there was never a stop for me. Um, that being said, I mentioned my education. Um, I education was something that I strongly held on to. That was a major constant in my life that I knew when I woke up in the morning, I would have that. That was mine. No one could take that away from me. So I threw myself into education at all times of my life. Um, that being said, I was able to graduate high school um, and continue my education at U of L. Like Dr. Sweeney said, go Cards. Um, love U of L. It's an amazing school. Um, at the age of 18, I left my third placement to live on campus. Um, however, I decided to recommit to the system um, for many reasons, but I just wanted that continued support. Um, I felt like if I just left the system, there would be no one in my life. So I, I wanted to have people around me. And with that being said, I um, finished U of L. I graduated at, um, sorry, um, 2022. Um, but that wasn't the biggest accomplishment in my life. Um, it was one of them, but not the biggest one. So a major thing um, about me al alongside education was finding a forever home. Once I discovered that failed adoption was real, I realized that having a forever family was something that I had to create for myself, but not only having a forever family, but having a forever home. So with that being said, when I um, left the dorm um, when I was in college, I was put into NECO's independent living program where they provided a, an apartment, fully furnished. It was all amazing. However, um, it wasn't the best apartment. And I got to be honest, uh, the concept of renting an apartment just did not make sense to me. Um, and so I don't know how people do it today, but it just it just didn't make sense to me. So one day I was talking to someone about my financials and I had like $20,000 in my bank account. Um, like, like I said, your girl likes to make money. So there was $20,000 in my bank account and someone told me, they were like, wow, that's a, that's a good first uh, down payment for a house. And after that, it was over. So after a whole year, I was able to double that. I had a goal of getting $40,000 in my bank account. And I was able to surpass that goal and get 48,000 in my bank account. And on my 21st birthday, I was able to sign on my first, my home, which I'm currently in now, the cold one that I told you guys about. Um, so that was my biggest accomplishment. I was able to put that $20,000 down um, on my 21st birthday, get all moved in and everything. So I was able to accomplish my goals. Um, I was able to have my forever home. That's mine. No one can take that away from me except for the government if I don't pay my bills, which I do. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, but I have also been able to find my forever family. I've been able to build my support system. Um, I'm currently, many people uh, know this about me now, but I'm currently playing volleyball, which um, is a very amazing community to be a part of. Um, and so I have been able to build support systems. I have an incredible boyfriend who I've been with for four years. Um, hopefully he'll put a ring on this finger soon, but that's another conversation for another time. Um, so I've able I've been able to reach my goals. Um, however, I'm still struggling with my growth as a person. Um, that is something that I don't believe I'll ever finish or complete. Growth is something that has continued for me. Um, so although I've been able to grow as an individual now, I still believe that there are other places that I can take myself mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, so that is something I dearly believe. Um, currently at the moment, I do have, I did finish this year. I graduated U of L with my master's. So your girl has two degrees. Yes, I'm about it. Um, but with that being said, um, I haven't been able to finish everything. Um, as a person that is very ambitious, I always have goals for myself. So yes, I've been able to accomplish those goals, but um, I continue to set goals to myself for myself. Oh, so with that being said, the plan is to continue to advocate, continue to share my testimony and continue to empower others to share the, theirs. Um, Cause for a long time, I didn't believe that uh, my testimony, my story mattered. Um, for the, the longest time people told me like, Hey, no one cares that you were in the foster system. Like it doesn't matter. You know, we all go through struggles. And while that is true, um, it doesn't mean that, um, my story isn't significant. Um, and that is something I like to share with all foster youth that I encounter, um, considering 
testimony sharing is is very empowering, not only for oneself, but for others. So I try and um, share that with everyone. Um, but I was not told that until I met a significant social worker who uh, he will not be named because if this gets back to him, he'll get a very big head. And I'm not about I'm not about the I told you so's. So um, but he was able to uh, start this journey with me. So um, I really appreciate that. And so I'm here to um, show and share the significance of lived experts. And yes, we are experts in this uh, in this system, in this experience and all of it. I believe that with a uh, joined you know, um, alliance with foster youth, foster parents, social workers, judges, whoever is in this system, I believe that with that partnership, we can all help to better this system um, that we know is struggling and lacking in many ways, but is also um, very helpful and, and very significant for lives. Because I will say, if it wasn't for the system, like, I, I wouldn't be in this house right now. That's so I am and I am entirely grateful to the system. However, there are things that I wish I did not have to go through that I did go through. And so I hope that as I move forward, I can try and alleviate or eliminate those instances and experiences for future foster youth that are going through the system now. Um, and with that also being said, I want to share um, that as a significant individual that is very extroverted, love speaking to people, um, it doesn't mean that um, the trauma that I went through was not significant. Um, many people wouldn't be able to see it just by looking at me. However, now that you all have gotten to know me, you, we all realize that you know there is significant trauma in my past. And that is something that I continue to work on even today. I'm sh still um, finding out triggers about myself. Um, there was the um, the negativity bias that Tony or Dr. Zippel spoke about, um, where you know that negativity just stays with you, and that that is very apparent in my life. Because although I'm very grateful for my last placement, who was amazing and helped me uh, become a better individual, um, that very first placement that was the hardest for me still lives with me. That's what I still have nightmares about. I don't have beautiful dreams about my last placement, but I still have nightmares to this day about my first placement. Um, and that is something that just, I have to continue to work with and continue to go through. Um, and so even though I'm 23 years old and I experienced those things at the age of seven, it's still with me. It's something that I have to still go through each and every day. Um, so not only my triggers, but also understanding how I function in this world. Um, so yes, although foster care doesn't matter to a bank or, you know, the mortgage people or whatever, it does matter in a way that it impacts my life. So I have to figure out how I can function in everyday life while also understanding that I have to give myself grace and understand that I am still learning as an individual because I'm only 23, although I feel like I'm 45 in my mind, but that's because my my brain has aged so quickly. Like Tony mentioned, I, um, at a very young age, had to grow up very quickly. So now I am taking that time um, to understand how my brain changed so quickly then and how it's still changing now, but also, I'm, I'm giving myself that opportunity to go back and relive my childhood. So I'm watching a lot of Tom and Jerry, which I love dearly, my favorite thing in the world. Um, and I'm giving myself that opportunity to actually be a child, even though I'm 23. But, you know, I have Capri Suns in my, in my fridge, um, just little snacks or whatever, just giving myself the opportunity to, uh, that I didn't have when I was uh, a younger individual. Cause I didn't have that opportunity, but that is something that I realize now I have the opportunity to do. Like I'm 23 years old, I can go to Kroger and just buy a cake for no reason. I don't have to wait for someone's birthday. I can just eat a whole cake myself and that's fine. Maybe not for my teeth, but it's fine for my life. And so that is something I really appreciate um, for myself um, to better um, show my growth and help myself to continue growing for in the future. Yeah, we're that, gonna. Um, yes, I was. We're gonna. I, gonna, I wanna. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Um, I want to tell you that you've gotten some affirmations in the chat box. I would love for you to um, continue offering those affirmations, but we do have a few questions for you. Yes. Um, yes. For the sake of time, um, 
Uh, there were a few hashtags in there, pay your girl, um, go Tia go, put a ring on it. Um, and uh, so we are we are cheering you on. I you. I can't believe 23 years old and how uh, gosh how far you have come. So I'm proud of you. I know the group is proud of you. And again, um, everyone's cheering you on. Um, and I hate to hate to stop you. So apologies. Okay, but I um, could talk all day. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. Can you tell us um, what were the long term changes you saw as a result of your stress and trauma? And you kind of you kind of talked about that. You know, um, really, it sounds like you really had to kind of rediscover who you are and who you wanted to be. Can you talk a little bit about some of those long term changes? Yeah, so honestly, the biggest thing about myself that um, was a result of um, a lot of this long term um, things is that I live in a constant fear. So, um, and that's something that I just discovered recently was that um, because of the abandonment and all that stuff, I live in a constant fear of losing people. So I will do any and everything in my power to keep people around me. However, you know, not all people are good people and not all people are necessary in your life. So that is something I've had to get accustomed with, with being okay with losing those individuals that um, are not the best for your life, but also living in that constant fear of, of giving myself that grace, like I mentioned, um, because anything that I would do wrong, I would take that so personally, because then I would believe that that person would see that and just be like, all right, we're not going to we're not going to deal with Tia anymore. And that's something that I have had to constantly reaffirm in myself that I am um, a worthy individual of other people, but also I don't need other people to validate me. So although I do want a support system, I don't need these people in my life to show me that I belong where I belong. So that constant fear is still something that I struggle with, but also, um, People used to compliment me with being able to learn quickly on high stress situations. Um, and I used to take that as a compliment, but now I realize that for the longest time, I just functioned in high stress situations. So that's all I knew. But when things, which is why I mentioned, like I had multiple jobs, I was in school, I was doing marching band, all of this stuff is because I needed that high function, that high stress situations to keep me from being able to relive what I was going through or understand fully what I was going through. And so if I were to stop, I would have to feel the emotions and feel the impact of what was going on. So I realized that um, I don't need to just be going all the time. I don't need to just be, you know, having three jobs and doing everything for other people, but also just, I need to take time. It's okay to just sit on my couch and just be in silence. And that's something I've had to learn a lot about well, within myself. While drinking Capri Suns and eating cake, right? While drinking Capri Suns <laughs> and watching Tom and Jerry. That is, that there you is go. Hey, nothing wrong with that uh, suggestion. Um, my kids love them some goldfish and it, uh, it brought up a lot for me in my, my childhood as well. Yes, um, the SOC Cheez-Its are my favorite. But yeah. <laughs> All right, last question for me. Um, we know that trauma reminders happen throughout our lives. We know that we can be, um, to use your word, uh, triggered often. How do you overcome um, those trauma reminders when they when they come up for you? How do you um, get back to that realize, realization that you need to protect your energy and that you are okay as you are? Yeah. Um, so that was something I struggled with for a very long time. Like my triggers were, I, I didn't, I didn't like burdening people. So I felt like my triggers were my problem. However, if I wanted the support system that I wanted, I needed other people to realize my triggers as well. Even in my workplace, they know my triggers. And so that was a major thing that I established uh, once I learned about these things is communication. Um, and I learned this in therapy, which is something I very highly advocate for um, therapy all the way. Um, however, I'm a huge communicator. I, I believe in, in speaking and, and telling any and everything that's on my mind that relates to me. And so when I do have triggers, for instance, when I'm playing volleyball and I just shank a ball or something and I, and I feel like these people are never going to be on a team with me ever again, then I have conversations with these individuals and let them know like, hey, I apologize for how I played, 
but I want you to know I'm trying to get better. Um, and I just, I just had a rough moment. And more times than not, they tell me, Tia, you actually played amazing. You just had that one mistake. And so that's something that I have to realize is that just because I do one thing wrong doesn't mean my whole life is over. It's it's a matter of seeing the bigger picture and knowing that I've done very well in my life for what has happened. You know, I've I've mentioned my accomplishments um and those are amazing and there are also small accomplishments that I've I've been able to um achieve as well. But it's the like I said uh uh, Dr. Dr. Zip or, or Tony, um, it's the it's the negatives that stick with me, and those is something I struggle with. So communication, I make sure to tell any and everyone what's going on with me, so that I make sure that we're all on the same page, and that I'm not gonna have to suffer from my intrusive thoughts because we're on the same page. They know what my trigger is, so when it happens, I don't have to just depend on me. I have other people that know, okay, that's Tia's trigger. This is what we need to do. And that's something I highly advocate for because communication is a big thing. As y'all know, I like to use words. I like to talk a lot. But this is something that I have needed to, to get past all of these things that I've, I've had to. My, my triggers, my re-triggers, um, the setbacks, all of it. It's something that communication has really been able to really help me uh, grow and prosper as a person as a person in my relationships. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's a lesson that we can all use. You know, um, I'm looking, I'm seeing so many um, educators, so many people that um, we have these cognitive distortions that tell us that in our roles, we must be perfect. And when we aren't, when we have that moment of um, perceived failure or, you know, a perceived mistake, you know, it almost feels like the end of the world. So um, take lessons from Tia, communicate those things, um, realize that those moments are just moments. Those are fictions that you're telling yourself. Um, they're fictions that your clients or students are telling themselves and um, they can overcome them and become resilient just like Tia is um, in her life. Um, thank you, Tia. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. Can you all give her a reaction real quick from your uh, taskbar and Zoom? My reaction is just going to be a heart. I loved your story. I loved your um, your sharing, your vulnerability, and um, I love your heart. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for having me and sharing my testimony today. I really appreciate it. All right. Tina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, Tina's going to lead us in some breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Tia. That was so, so it's always nice to hear your testimony. Um, and at this point, we're going to take some time to um, get into breakout groups and share your reactions and discuss strategies um, that we can use to build, um, build resilience in Kentucky's kids. Um, in a few minutes, Carly will put us all in breakout groups and we'll have about 15 minutes to discuss what we heard today from Tony and Tia. Um, and then at the end of that, we will have the, our facilitators report out at least one or two key takeaways that um, we heard today. So that'll be in just a few moments. Um, um, now we're going to take some time to um, just share one or two key takeaways that you've had um, in your discussion. And I was in a breakout room, so I'll go first. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, my group, the first question we had, um, what are we, what were our biggest takeaways from Tia and Tony? And folks uh, shared that um, hearing the, that lived experience combined with the psychological side really resonated and, sh and showed how resiliency is possible and that um, just sharing those options that Tia, Tia had in her um, experience helped folks think of other ways they can um, support the youth or the adults they work with. Um, um, and some intentional uh, things that they'll do is um, use the fire model in with the clients and populations they work with. Yeah, I really appreciate hearing from everyone. Um, I will move on to another group. Keith, would you like to share a few things or someone in your group? Uh, sure, I, I took the notes, so I'll go ahead and share, but any, you know, uh, Pat or Tia or Melissa or Christy, Haley or Lori, jump in quickly if you want to add to it. Uh, we kind of bundled both questions. We didn't get too deep into the second question, ran out of time, but I think that second question was part of the first question. And people answered both for the most part. Uh, similar, some of, some of the things that stuck out group was uh, learning to recognize traumatic behaviors came up. Uh, 
you know, what the brain is capable of around change, uh, the impact of negative experiences and moving to positive ones. Uh, Tia's story was powerful, clearly, and that the power of testimony and 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 how that can be utilized um, to write goals uh, as a as a case management approach. Uh, the usefulness of information and you know global real experiences was talked about in uh, an importance of how the brain operates and where change in behavior comes from. Um, the questions we ask, in particular, uh, in, you know, ch changing the question from you know what's wrong with you to what happened came up quite a bit. And we talked about that experience. Uh, and then uh, what it means to come at this from an entry level. So some, someone in our breakout room uh, found it very helpful and grounding to uh, given uh, her role and where she approached this and found it really helpful to have a better understanding around it for personally and professionally. And then the last thing uh, is the accountability partner really resonated uh, for members in the group and using that as a 60 seconds contact and how that might be used as an approach for uh, someone's caseload. So that's kind of a bundle of both. Thank you. Uh, and whoever wants to go next. I could go next um, because of something that you just said. Maybe think of what we talked about. You talked about the power of testimony. Um, and we talked about that as well, but also the power of friendship and the power of resources. Um, and Tia's example of when she said she was talking to her friends and her friends encouraged her to reach out to, to support and how amazing that was and how that was in such an important part um, and her ability to acknowledge that. So Tia, that really resonated with a lot of folks in our group. Um, we also talked about the same things that y'all have discussed, which is just the shining example um, that your story is and how you are an inspiring example of resiliency um, and how the folks who work directly with youth especially can take that and can show the people they work with like it is possible because like so many people said in the comments um, throughout the, the conversations today, it's really hard for students to realize that there is that hope um, and just your willingness to share your story and being so positive is, is gonna help them be able to say, here's a story she did it, you know, and you can do it too. So um, thank you so much for what you shared. Um, all right. The second question, we saw the same thing, the healing centered approach. So you are not your trauma that came up a couple times and moving beyond to the question of what's strong in you. Um, and again, just the, just the emphasis on what we talked about in the first conversation of being affirmative, being positive and how that can make such a big difference, that carrot versus the stick. And so uh, just putting that focus on being affirmative and telling youth and, and adults when they've done a good job, when you're proud of them, and how that can make such a big difference in their lives. That's great. Thank you, Leah. Lee, sorry. I apologize. Um, yeah, I um, would like to hear from um, another group. Uh, Clarissa, would you like to share? Yes, I will share. So, our group we had a lot of great things to say, and we chose the top three that we wanted to talk about briefly. So the from the first question, we had three responses about how the negativity bias was really powerful so that kids can protect themselves and protect we can protect ourselves from causing further damage and re-traumatization. And from the second question, we had a common theme of patience, um, showing patience when engaging with youth. And then also focusing on being as positive and encouraging as possible by focusing on their wins and their strengths. So those are the most prominent points we pulled. Thank you so much. Um, BJ, would your group like to share? Yes, yes, we would. I had a great group uh, from healthcare, the school system, public, I mean, nonprofit organizations that work with children and advocate for kids, and it, it was phenomenal. I think we had several reasons to celebrate what we learned from the group, uh, reminders that we can change no matter how old we are. So that was the real positivity, the neuroplasticity of the brain, and that the importance of repetition and making those changes to go from the negative to the positive and what that means, but it is important to do that. Most everything uh, that we talked about, I think has been said, um, 
from the school perspective, it is what we are so aware of. Teachers have a lot on their plates. So how do we support teachers as they help children? And we talked about the importance of um, self-care and the value of that. But we also talked about one of the small things that can be done is believing in a child. And Tia told us that. And uh, it's something that Bounce highly advocates for to build resilience and offset trauma. It takes one person, one person to believe in a child. And that came out quite uh, strongly in the group as well when we talked about the school systems. So uh, while there were several other things we talked about, I wanted to highlight those. Awesome. Thank you so much, BJ. Um, we will, we'd like to hear um, more group, um, but before we get there, um, there will be a link in the chat um, for a survey. If you all could access that link, um, let me know. If there's any issues, let me know as well. Um, but we'll, our next group will be uh, Melissa's group, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So we had a great group as well. Great discussion. Uh, so some of the key takeaways that we talked through that, you know, again, kind of are popping up from the other groups um, was that stress and trauma. Yes, they're there. Yes, you, you, you've experienced those. And but also knowing that there is still hope within all of that. So um, that was something that our, our folks kind of discussed. Um, and then also another interesting thing um, that we that we discussed was that, you know, one Yes, Tia, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're a rock star. Um, so we talked a little bit about how, what are maybe some of those barriers that um, maybe stop a young person from being, you know, as, as successful as they can be, right? And so, and kind of all the, the wonderful things that Tia, that you've been able to accomplish, um, how, why is it that maybe some young people don't necessarily get to that point? So we talked through about uh, that a little bit. And really came to the to the conclusion that what it comes down to is that you need to be that support for that person, right? So really leaning in, having those better social supports around that young person, um, that connection with the right person in the right ways is really what we've um, what we were pulling out of there. And then, in terms of what are the ways that we can be intentional and in, and in, in bring to this space um, those positive childhood experiences. We talk through what it might look like to really just stick with that young person, right? They may bring that that experiences. They may, you know, be in not so great headspaces sometimes. But what does it look like to continue to be that support person no matter what that situation is and stick with it? Um, another thing was listening, um, just taking the time to be that person to listen um, and to actually hear. Um, and then also how the individual relationships, yes, are so important, but we also need those social environments. So we need those advocates who are working at a systems level to be simultaneously working with those folks who are working on the ground with, with our young people. And then lastly, we discussed how we also, as that person, as that support person for our young people, taking the time to refill our own cups so that then we can give to our young people in the best way possible. So um, being sure that we're holding space intentionally for ourselves to be the best version of ourselves for our young people. That is awesome, Melissa. Yeah, I really love that. Um, taking time to take care of yourself, to take care of everyone. Um, our next group, uh, Bev, would you like to go? Share some sure, sure. Um, we had a small group, but a great group, and there was a lot of learning that went on. And um, so this was the um, for I think the majority of the group, the first time they'd heard um, about the brain being hardwired to remember the negative rather than the positive. So that that was something that um, we talked about, and and along with that. Um, they were really excited to know that you can um, sort of neutralize the effects of trauma with positive experiences. Um, so um, that that's a very hopeful message that got shared today and that resonated with them. Um, I know we're running short on time. So um, they had some good practical ways that they were going to use what they learned today. Um, in their in their work with their clients and in their um, personal lives as well, but one one of the things that I thought um, was was a really practical 
um, utilization of the information today was to encourage kids, and, and Tia talked about this too, to get involved in extracurricular activities because um, there's an observation that sometimes kids that are struggling, just they just want to shut down. And so the more that you can encourage them to make connections and um, participate in extra, extracurricular activity, those interactions increase. And um, a lot of times it's going to lead to positive experiences in, um, in their lives. And we had one person who works with child care providers and she made a comment that sometimes these child care providers think of themselves sort of as babysitters and she wanted to in her trainings incorporate more at the forefront of um stressing the importance of the child care providers um understanding how important positive experiences are and uh, the brain development of of the children that they're, you know, in the care of. So I thought that was really impactful that she's talking about, you know, um, changing basically what she's stressing sometimes in her training with the child care providers and, and reinforcing to them what a positive and important role that they have in those children's lives. Um, especially in terms of their their brain development. So th those were the main takeaways. Thank you, Bev. Those mm -hmm. are some, some great conversations. Um, I know we have a couple more groups um, that we wanted to hear from. Um, so if you could share one one or two key takeaways, um, I'll move it on to um, Jacqueline. Yes. Um, a couple takeaways, just that resiliency takes time, but it absolutely is possible. Um, our group just specifically spoke about hearing about that from Tony and Tia that that there is hope. And um, also just a shout out to Damian. They loved the request for the um, reactions and feedback from the group for the positive affirmations for our speakers. So thanks to Damian for that. And then some intentional takeaways, open communication. Tia spoke about how important that was uh, for her. And so um, committing to being open in our communication, listening more, uh, not being judgmental, and um, a commitment to use this with some of the foster families, uh, use the information shared today with some of the foster families that um, that they work with. Jacqueline, um, Alicia, would you like to share one or two things? Sure, I'll try to be really brief. Um, so one thing that stuck out to the group um, in the first question is just about how much brain function is happening in young kids and I guess brain development more so. Um, and so how much they're taking in at young ages and um, kind of debunking the myth that a lot of people might say, like, they won't remember this when they get older. And so the fact that their brain is going to remember and their body is going to remember. And so that kind of stuck with the group. Um, and how, so how impactful those early experiences are. And then um, the second part, our group um, it was really uh, the overachievers who have been to lots of balance trainings and are already doing a lot of really great things in their practices. But we did touch on um, ways to kind of take what they're doing and spread it to other members of their staff or other employees and kind of model behavior for others who maybe aren't trained on things like this to be able to be a positive um, person in young people's lives. So things like be, taking advantage of 60 seconds in the hallway at the school to check in with students and being that positive um, person for them. And so trying to spread that to others in the building as well was brought up. Thank you, Alicia. And we'll um, pass it on to Crystal and then we'll close out with Damien. Yeah, thanks, Tina. I'll try to be really quick as well. No, we're running short on time. Um, so our group had another really great discussion and it sounded like the presentations that we had today were really kind of just affirming to some folks of the work that's already being done at their agency. And then um, in regards to the elasticity of youth's brain, it sounded like there was a really big takeaway around that and just um, being able to uh, to have the opportunity to educate those who work with youth and kind of bridging that gap between why a kid reacted that way and what's really going on. Um, and so some of the intentional ways to bring in those positive 
childhood experiences were kind of um, our conversation kind of flowed along with alongside what Tia talked about of just like tapping into our inner child and doing fun things with youth to reinforce those positive community experiences, um, as well as providing parent education and kind of helping them understand that, um, helping them understand that their responses to the way their child reacts is important. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your participation today, for joining us. Thank you for filling out the survey. Um, thank you once again to our spotner, our sponsors, Aetna. Um, make sure I say it right. Aetna Better Health of Kentucky and the YMCA. Um, please look out for future um, ground rounds in the spring of 2024. We will definitely be in touch. And if there are things that we can do to serve you better, um, reach out to us and let us know that as well. You all have a great day. Thank you.